welcome to NAMC Channel 6 Focus Program. I'm Joe Adair. I'll be your host today. And on our program this afternoon, we have a gentleman that uh, is pretty darn fascinating. He does some things that I know you and I probably wouldn't even dare to do. He is a beekeeper. Don Snoink, welcome back. Uh, it's nice to see you again. As I said, I've, I've seen you before at the library. It's an awesome presentation and it's a wealth of information. Um, you are a beekeeper by trade. This is your full-time job or? It is not my full-time job. I, I keep bees part-time and we formed a small business where we do presentations like you saw and we also teach beekeeping classes. Wonderful. Um, what does it take to be a beekeeper? <laughs> helps Besides to, getting stung, stung a lot of times? Helps to be a little bit crazy. Takes a little bit of money to start. Mm -hmm. um, but one, once you are actually keeping bees and producing honey, then you can sell honey that uh, covers the cost of being a beekeeper. How many so, hives does it take to get to that point? When I start people out in my classes, I say you got to start with at least two hives, preferably three. That way you're going to probably get some honey from at least one of those hives. Now I used to buy honey from a friend of mine that was a beekeeper and he said, Don, you got to keep bees yourself. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. It's too much money. But then finally I decided, okay, I'm going to try it and see how it goes. And once I finally started, um, a month after I kept had kept bees for just one month. I caught a swarm in my yard on a tree and I was hooked ever since. How many bees are typically in a hive? Generally in a full hive, the July 1st when the population is the highest in the bee colony, there are 60,000 bees in a full-sized colony. Okay, 60,000 bees and only one queen. Only one of those is a queen. Now how now, do they make a queen? Every bee in that colony is a daughter. If it's a worker bee, it's a girl bee. It's a daughter of that queen bee. Now, a worker bee starts out as an egg. For three days it's an egg, and then it hatches into a larva. We say it's a little, like a little grub, a little white grub in the shape of a sea. And it gets fed many times per day by the worker bees. They do all the work of the hive. Not fair for the girls, is it? But hey, yeah, that's how that's, life goes. That's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> so then, after six days as a larva, it gets capped over by the worker bees with a waxy substance, and then it's 12 days under that capping. So it's three days an egg, six days a larva, 12 days under that capping. So it's 21 days from the time it's laid as an egg to the time that the new worker bee transforms into a honeybee under that capping much the way a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. It's that same process happening. It pupates and turns into a honeybee. Then it chews its way out of that cell. And 21 days after it was laid as an egg, it chews its way out and emerges from the cell. And we have a new worker bee. Now, now a queen bee, any fertilized egg, which is a worker bee egg, can become a queen bee. If in that six days of the larval life, they keep the special diet of royal jelly. Generally, a larva is fed royal jelly only three days of the six-day larval life. But if they want it to be a queen bee, they don't switch to honey and pollen on the fourth day, like they do for a worker bee. But they keep feeding it royal jelly, royal jelly, royal jelly every day. And then, in fact, it turns into a big peanut shell-shaped cell, like you see here. All these are queen cells. They make several queen cells when they need a new queen. The first queen out of a cell will go around and sting the others to death so that she's the one remaining monarch ah, in that so hive. That's how you narrow it down to one. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've brought some more bees with you today. I mean, we can hear them. I have, so. and I hear them buzzing too. See if I can bring them up for you to see. Oh, they're louder now. Whenever we do a presentation, we always bring honeybees in season. Um, from May to late September, we can usually bring honeybees. And you can see down here, we, we generally have a queen on display. I'm not seeing her right now, but she might be covered with bees. We have brood here, some of the capped brood in these cells here you can see. Up here we have honey. It's capped over honey. It's ripe and ready for harvest. Um, I'll see if I can find the queen That's for you. What's the different physical appearance of the queen? The queen is actually longer than all the rest of the bees. She has a long, tapered abdomen. Now, the three parts of a bee's body are head, thorax, and abdomen. So the abdomen on the queen is long and tapered. It comes to a point. And the thorax, the back part, is black and shiny. 
Now, she'll be larger than these? She is larger than the rest. Not a lot. Many people see this and say, I thought the queen would be a lot bigger. Right. And what's her function? Her function in the hive is to lay eggs. She's an egg-laying machine. She lays 2,000 eggs every day in May and June when she's laying the most eggs. So it's an incredible amount of eggs. Now, she'll stop laying eggs this time of year in the fall when we get headed into winter, just before the first frost. She'll stop laying eggs. And then in January, when the days start getting longer, she'll start laying eggs again. Not 2,000 a day anymore, but then she'll just lay a small patch of brood and they'll keep that 95 degrees around that patch of brood all winter long. And now they, the bees do that themselves? They, they generate do. the heat? They do. They generate their own heat by shivering their thoracic muscle, which is the muscle they use to flap their wings, but they don't flap their wings. They eat honey and shiver that thoracic muscle, and um, that creates heat, and then they radiate that heat into their head and go head first into a cell so that they can put that heat right on the larva, right where it needs to be. Yeah, Absolutely solar amazing. system. Yeah. Okay, now what, what, what happens when that queen dies? The bees can actually tell if the queen's uh, pheromone or smell is diminishing. They can tell if she's ready to die or beginning to malfunction. So they'll replace her, and they'll do that by taking a fertilized egg, which is a worker bee egg, and then they will uh, develop queen cells like this. And once that queen cell, that new queen has emerged and gone out and mated, come back to the hive, then the older queen generally will die off. And then the worker bees will toss out the old queen and the new queen is taken over. Okay, so then what would be the next stage? The next stage uh, in the bee's life then would be to uh, live three weeks in the hive when it comes out of that um, cell, it doesn't fly out right away from the hive, but it lives three weeks in the hive doing many different jobs. It does a, um, feeds the young larva, it guards the hive, it defends the hive with a sting. Uh, it does so many different jobs in the hive, but after three weeks, then it becomes a forager bee, one of the bees that flies from the hive and gathers water, pollen, nectar, anything that's needed for the hive. It's all done by the worker bees, the girl bees. Good information. Thanks, Don. We're going to take a little break right now so we can set up a few different things and go into some other aspects of beekeeping. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back. And as I said earlier, we are with Don Snewink, and he is a beekeeper. And we've already gone through some aspects of what makes a hive. What's the next stage? One of the most important jobs of a honeybee is pollination. Now, one third of all the food we eat is a direct result of pollination from a honeybee. Can you imagine that? What would we not be eating if it weren't for the pollination of a honeybee? Apples, oranges, pears, peaches, cucumbers. Uh, kids are going to be buying a pumpkin soon. That's because pollination from a honeybee. It's totally amazing and farmers and orchardists will actually rent hives of bees and bring them to their orchard in the spring, let's say, if that's when that plant or tree is blooming, to pollinate their products. Until two weeks are up, the blooms are done, they bring the hives back home or to someplace else to do pollination. Rent a bee. Amazing, exactly. <laughs> and that's how many full-time beekeepers make money by renting out their bees for pollination. Now, I'm not a full-time beekeeper. I do this part-time for fun and I don't rent out my bees. But another important job that honeybees do is to produce food. It's one of the few insects that produce food for human consumption. Now, do you like honey? Love honey. Love honey. I have honey almost every day of the week, every day of the year, in fact, I'll bet. And I too love honey. Now, bees make honey by finding the sweetest nectar within two miles from their hive. Two miles. Ever bite two miles? Ever walk two miles? It's a long ways. And they get the, the pollination from different kinds. Of, it's not just from one plant. That's right. They get nectar and pollen from different 
just um, different flowers. Now I was going to show you the size of a honeybee compared to two miles that they go to get pollen and nectar. It's amazing distance, two miles in any direction, so they're covering a lot of acreage. Big radius. Yes, it is. Now when they go to find nectar, they're finding the sweetest nectar within two miles from their hive. And they fill up their honey stomach, which is like a crop on a chicken, let's say. They have two stomachs a one-way valve between the two stomachs. So they fill up their honey stomach with nectar, open up that valve and let some of that nectar go into their food stomach so they have energy to fly back to the hive. Get back to the hive and they connect proboscis, the part of their mouth that's like a straw, with a receiver bee, one of those bees living its three weeks inside the hive, remember? And they transfer that nectar to the receiver bee. The receiver bee puts it into cells. And now it's honey because of the enzymes, chemicals added by the bee's body, but mm -hmm. it's very watery and they need to evaporate that water out of the hive. And they do that by fanning their wings. <laughs> Lots of bees fanning their wings, bringing air into the hive and out of the hive. And that way they can dry down that honey, that nectar. Now it's honey officially until it's about 16% water. Now the flowers and the different things that they go and get pollen from, does that dictate a different kind of honey? Certainly does. Every plant or every blossom produces a different kind of honey. And these have what we call flower fidelity, which means they're faithful to one kind of flower every time out of the hive. So every time out of the hive, if they went to a dandelion first, they're going to go to all dandelions until they get back to the hive again. Oh. So that flower fidelity gives us different flavors different colors of honey. You can see this is a darker honey, this is a lighter honey. Pollens too come in all different colors, purple, brown, black, white, orange, beautiful, all different colors of pollen. Now if I can show you this, this is a frame of honey. This is four pounds of honey, so four of these bottles, one pound bottles, is what we would get out of one of these frames of honey. Now once the bees have capped the honey with the wax from their bodies, they got an all nice white wax around both sides of that frame, it's ready for harvest. When I get 10 frames in a box, all capped over like this, then I can take those frames, take that whole box, get the bees off back into their hive, and I put this frame into an extractor that holds, mine holds six frames, and I first cut off the wax capping from both sides. You do that manually? I do that manually. Okay. I use a serrated bread knife. Some people use a hot electric knife that kind of melts and cuts the wax at the same time. Mm -hmm. I put six in my extractor and turn it on and here's what it does. And it throws the honey out of the cells. So once the honey is out of those cells, we can take those frames out of the extractor and they look like this. They have just the comb on them, no honey anymore. So then, if it's July and the bees are still making honey, we can put those frames back onto the hive, and the bees, they smell that there was honey in these cells, and they fill them right back up again. Oh, so you can recycle so the comb. Recycle the comb. That's the beauty of, of having an extractor, mm -hmm. where I don't have to destroy that comb. Now, when I teach my new beekeeper classes, I say, don't spend all that money on an extractor. Wait some years until you get more hives. Just destroy the comb, crush it, and strain it, and then the bees will make fresh wax again for you next year. Now, I see the one has a honeycomb in it. So many people say, when I was a kid, I remember that we used to have honey in the comb. And this is what we call chunk comb honey. We have honeycomb in there surrounded by liquid honey. And the fun part about this is we can have one flavor of honey in the comb and a different flavor from a different harvest as the liquid around it. So that's really fun. Another thing is, see the bubble going up here? Mm -hmm. That's liquid honey. Now, see the bubble going up here? Nope. <laughs> it looks like applesauce, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Actually. Well, we better throw this one away, right? No, 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 no. Give it a hot water bath. That's all you got to do, and it'll go back to liquid again. Now, this is honey that started out looking like that. That's right. It crystallized. And someone might think that it was spoiled. That's right, but it's just crystallized honey. I have cut the honey off of the top of my jar because it seems to start it at the top. So you go, oh, you know, that's sure. gotten bad. So you yes. cut that off. Now the Europeans will eat that honey when it's crystallized like that as creamed honey. They let it crystallize on a real fine crystal like this. And I'll take some of my fall honey, which crystallizes very smooth. 
If I put this 10 seconds in the microwave, just 10 seconds, I could take that out like butter on a knife and mm. spread it on my toast. Oh, it's making me hungry just thinking about <laughs> it. But if I take some of that and mix it in with some liquid honey like this, let it sit in a cool room, 57 degree room in my basement in the wintertime, in three weeks, I got this cream honey and that's gourmet. I love this stuff. So it can cream before it crystallizes? It's actually crystallized honey. If you were to heat this in a hot water bath, it would be liquid honey. All over again. Yep. Recyclable even. It's amazing. Now what is this? Comb. This is comb that the bees made from wax from their bodies. Now they can put eggs in there, they can put honey in there, they can put pollen in there. Comb is used for all different things. And uh, it's very lightweight. It starts out real white and gets darker with the age and use. But another thing we do when we cut off the wax from the cappings, that wax we let drain of honey and then we'll take that wax and melt it down. We can make uh, hand cream. Uh, this is our skincare product that we put on our lips. And when my oh. fingers crack and bleed in the winter, I put that stuff in there before I go to bed. It's amazing stuff. It just heals right over overnight. I thought it was a little candle. Nope, we have candles but too. But we do though. make candles, don't we? Can we? <laughs> pour, we can pour um, the beeswax into molds and make candles. We do that. We enjoy doing that. We also have rolled candles like this that we make with the kids at our shows usually. When yeah, we, do we did that at the library. It was fascinating. The kids right. had a great time. I made one. That's right. Yep. I'm glad you did too. And it comes out looking like that. Yep, we put a, put a wick on with a Mmm, pure beeswax sheet and uh, roll it up and it turns into this. Now an amazing thing about beeswax candles is they emit negative ions which actually clean the air when they burn and they burn hot and bright and relatively smoke free. So I kept mine, it's just pretty. It's just pretty to look <laughs> at and I like the smell especially. So, so many things you could do and so many things that are amazing about not just the honey but the wax. People even can buy the pollen in health food stores. You can buy the pollen pellets. Some people feel like it's very healthy for them. What would they do with them. them? They just eat? Yeah, just eat it. Hmm. Uh, use it in recipes and things, I think. Now, all of these different kinds of honey, are they relatively easy to find? I mean, do, does that just come in the grocery? I've never seen the, the crystallized or the creamed honey in a grocery store. Probably that something you have to make yourself? Probably you wouldn't see it in a grocery store, but when I see it in health food stores. Specialty stores. Some kind, sometimes, but yeah, I try not to buy honey from the store. <laughs> I, yeah, I can see where you wouldn't. <laughs> okay, yeah. is there anything else that we need to know on how honey is made? I think that we've basically covered it. It's just a fascinating product. Honey has been used for thousands of years by even the ancient Egyptians who used it for wound healing and in many different things. Um, during the Civil War years too, they used to use it for wound healing and, and just so many things. It's an amazing, amazing product. Huh, it certainly is. And I had no idea that it was so versatile. But let's take another little break here and we'll come back in just a few minutes and we'll wrap up. Great. Thanks, Don. Welcome back. We are still here with Don Snewink, and we have been discussing bees to great lengths. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of our last segment, uh, we took a break and you talked about some other things that honey's good for. You know, honey that's the right moisture content, if it's about 16% water content, it can last for almost forever. They found honey from the ancient Egyptians, uh, and they could tell it was still honey. I don't think they put it on their toast. 
to eat it, but I could tell it was still honey. But if it's a higher moisture content than 16%, 18 or so, it could ferment over time. What happens but when it ferments? With fermented honey, they'll turn that into mead. And with mead is? Mead is the oldest known alcoholic drink to mankind. It's fermented honey. People call it honey wine. It's actually not a, technically a wine, but it's fermented honey. It can be very good. And medicinal purposes? Topically, um, yeah, I think that's the, probably the most common way is, is topical use of honey on burns. When I'm loading the wood stove in the wintertime at home, I often will touch the wood stove and spurn my skin just a little bit, go up to a little bit of honey on that for 30 seconds. Any kind Take, of honey? Takes the burn right away. Yeah, that's good information. Amazing stuff. That's good information. Um, what about the bee sting itself? I think I've heard you say that there's actually some treatments for sure. arthritis or right bee venom therapy. It's called, and it, it's I've been a couple of seminars about it. It's very convincing. I'm sure that the ancient Egyptians, who were also beekeepers, used this. So it's old, old medicine. But um, when a bee stings, it stings to either defend its hive or defend himself. And when I get stung by a bee, it marks me with a scent. That says, here's the bad guy, get him. <laughs> so then everybody jumps so on. Exactly. So I'll reach for my smoker and puff that spot so that that confuses that banana smell, which is the alarm smell that the bees give off, so that I don't get another one to sting me in that same spot. But I have found, too, that uh, bee stings, the more I get them, the less my body reacts to them. Now, if you were to see a swarm of bees hanging in a tree or something like that, you wouldn't have to be concerned as much about those bees because they don't have a home to defend. They're hanging here temporarily while they go out and search for a new home. Right, we get calls from the municipality of, you know, some resident will call and say, oh, there's this big beehive in front of my house. What are we supposed to do? That's right. What should they do? They call in a panic, don't they? Yes, what they do. What do I do? I don't dare let my dog go yes, out to pee. Yes, my kids have, have to go to bees. school and yes. go past it. Now, actually, those bees, as they hang in a tree branch or whatever, are very docile. They're filled with honey. Their, their stomachs are filled with honey because they engorge on honey before they leave the hive. Now, why did they leave the hive? They left the hive because it's swarm season, primarily. May, June in Michigan is swarm season, depending on the kind of spring weather we've had. Um, this is the way bees propagate themselves. One hive has started a whole bunch of new queen cells. At that point, half those bees leave in a tornado of bees, and they go and hang in a tree branch somewhere. Now, this hive the queen, the new queen, emerges from one of those cells, goes out and mates, comes back to the hive, and here we have a new hive. Whereas over here, these guys are hanging on a tree branch, sending out scout bees to find a new home. They're doing a special waggle dance on that swarm to tell the others where to go next. They're going to find a hollow tree and live in that tree. We had one hive here, now we have two hives. That's what they do to propagate themselves. They have kind of an odd communication type thing, but they do communicate. That's right. Part of that, I just told you that waggle dance mm -hmm. on the swarm is another thing, is something that they do in the hive after they have collected nectar into their stomachs and brought it back into the hive. And they'll start doing a waggle dance on the actual comb itself. Where I'll do it here for you. Here's a bee, head first, up doing a waggle, around, waggle, around the other way, waggle. See what number I'm making, what shape I'm making? An eight. Right? They're doing a figure eight dance with a strong waggle of their abdomen in the center of that eight. Now, if their head is upward on the comb, that means toward the sun. Head downward on the comb when they waggle, away from the sun. Head to the left, left of the sun. Head to the right, right of the sun. So now, if the sun is in the sky, let's say right up there, okay? We'll drop that to the horizon. That's toward the sun. Away from the sun, left of the sun, and right of the sun and they get a taste of nectar. The other bees get a taste of nectar while the bees doing the dance. They give them all a taste of nectar, and that gives them a smell for the nectar source. So now they can go out and find that nectar source. Is that not amazing? That Absolutely. is phenomenal. Now, did they bring a queen with them, or they create a queen? Which ones? The, the ones new swarm. In the new swarm brought the old queen with, with them. them. Okay. Yep, so they got the old queen with them, and generally within the next six months, probably... If it's May or June when they swarm, probably by September they have replaced the queen. 
with so a new queen. So the process started all over again. Exactly. So now this old hive has a new queen, relatively, mm -hmm. June. Now this next hive, the swarm, has requeened itself, probably, too. So they have a new queen going into winter, which is a good thing sometimes. Well, that's amazing. Okay, Dan. How do you get this information out to people? I mean, do you, you go, I know you went to the library. Um, do you offer your services to schools, libraries? Is that a presentation that you do on a regular basis? We do. We give presentations. We do ask to be paid for that, but that's part of what we do. Um, we go, we've gone all over the state. We've done several in Detroit. We do them in the Grand Rapids area where I'm from, where I live in the Grand Rapids area. Um, libraries, schools, almost any place that wants to hear about bees. I would think that even a corporation, rather than hiring a clown for their entertainment yeah. for the kids, right. right, for their summer picnic, why not hire a beekeeper? Oh, the kids at the library have just loved your show. And we love doing it. What I like to see is that the parents of the kids at the library shows that we do, their eyes open up and oh, they the sit up straight and listen too. Right. So I like to see that too. Right. And sometimes when we do a talk at a nature center, my best compliment is I'll get a, I'll get a guy my age come up and say, I really didn't want to come here today. You could just <laughs> tell made me. <laughs> wife made him come. He says, but that was great. I yeah. loved it. it no, I really enjoyed it. Right. So that's, a, that's one of my favorite compliments because I know he'd rather be fishing. I like to fish. But he came to that bee talk and just thoroughly enjoyed himself. Well, that's great. And like I said, when, it, when, you, when you get to a full presentation, like we were pretty limited as far as camera space and stuff to do it here, so we've kind of capped on things. And I have seen your presentation. It is awesome. It's more detailed than what we actually did here today. And if you want to see some more of this, you can get a hold of Don at thornapplewoodlands.com. And we will put that across the screen so that you can't forget. Um, great information, Don. Enjoyed having you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for watching NEMC Channel 6 Focus Program. I'm Joe Adair. Be sure and keep watching. We'll have more great information and great programs on for you in the future.